Good morning, and thank you for joining us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for joining us for today's episode in the museum's Facebook Live series. I'm your host, historian Edna Friedberg. During these programs, we discuss Holocaust history and its relevance in our world today. Every artifact, every photo, every document in our collection has its own message for us. Today is Ask a Curator Day. It's your moment to hear the stories hidden within the seemingly ordinary objects in our collection, to learn about the people who once owned them and the history which they illuminate. Please join me in welcoming today's guest, my colleague and friend, Judith Cohen, Chief Acquisitions Curator who has been with the museum for 25 years. Good morning, Thank Judith. Good morning. I'm so glad to have you here. And it's great to be here. Please send us your questions for Judy by posting them in the comments section and we'll get to as many of them live in the course of the show as we are able. If you run into any technical difficulties during the stream, don't worry about it. Uh, the show will be available to view on demand on Facebook immediately following. So please come back and watch it later and share it with your friends. Now, Judy, I didn't come from a museum background. I didn't understand about collections, um, the, the object, the physical material. Um, that a museum collects um, until I worked here. And ours holds millions of objects seemingly um, every day. Letters, articles of clothing, wartime film and photos, and it's the world's most diverse collection from the Holocaust era. Could you please introduce us to it? Tell us a little bit about what's contained in it and why. Well, as you said, it's one of the most diverse collections in the world. It contains three-dimensional objects, items of clothing, but also lots of correspondence, documents, photographs, film. Some of the collections are um, dozens of archival boxes of material, our largest collections. Some are just an individual item, one individual artifact, one individual photograph, but each item tells us something unique. The name of our institution, as you know, is United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And sometimes we separate the museum part from the memorial part. And it's with the collection that we bring the two together. Each artifact teaches us something that we can tell the rest of the world, but it also memorializes individuals. We talk about creating virtual tombstones. And through the collection, we can tell the experiences of individuals whose stories would otherwise not be known. I think it's also just a way to make it um, very real, very tangible for people. Right. Um, and our collection, obviously, it documents the horrific, uh, but also the mundane. There are photos of children's birthday parties, but not regular birthday parties, ones held in ghettos, uh, bureaucratic records that track the murder of millions of human beings. And we hold the evidence of these extraordinary crimes and the everyday experiences of ordinary people side by side. Um, Take us inside, Judy, though. Let's start by looking at the largest single artifact, the largest object in our holdings. Okay, the largest artifact is one that's actually an iconic artifact. And we got it in 1989 before the museum was complete. Here you see it being lowered by a crane. It's a rail car. And as you can see, there are no walls to the museum because the museum was actually built around the artifact. It's so large that it wouldn't fit through a door, it wouldn't fit through a window. Um, but the rail car has a huge significance because this is the rail car that is the make and the model of the type of rail cars that were used for deportation. And when the museum reopens after COVID, visitors will have an opportunity to get inside this actual rail car. It's on the third floor of the exhibit and you was, walk through it and visitors are inside it for five seconds, 10 seconds, if they really linger, maybe 20 or 30 seconds. And it's dark and it's musty and it's a little spooky. And there's obviously no place to relieve yourself. There's no cafe car, that's for sure. It's just a dark, hollow space. And yet when you go through it, you have to remember that some people were there not for five, 10, 15 seconds, but for upwards of a week during these deportation actions. And to give people a sense of scale, it's a little hard to tell looking at this construction photo uh, from the early 1990s. We have the Washington Monument off there to the left, but 
Um, this was a, a train car that was not intended to transport human beings. It was for cargo or for livestock. And the Nazis would pack uh, up to 100 or 120 human beings uh, into this, this small space. Um, but Judy, of course, it's not the scale of the object that shows its significance. And we have many much smaller, even tiny objects in our collection that are, are no less important. Um, show us some of those, please. Okay, so for me, actually, I'm more interested in the smaller objects because they tell individual stories. And included in the collection is a large collection of rings. Some of these were found in killing spots, but some were donated by survivors. And there's one ring in particular that really speaks to me, and it was donated by a couple, Flora and Louis Pearl. And what's unusual about that ring is that the two of them, having been deported to Auschwitz, having survived Auschwitz, they were transferred to a subcamp of Dachau called Kalfering. They met in the camp kitchen and fell in love and had a courtship in concentration camp. And you see love sort of conquering the horrors around them. And despite the starvation, Lewis bartered some precious bread for these rings that were brought into the camp with other material that had been confiscated. And he had the rings inscribed, Lewis, Flora, 1944. They were then separated. She was on a death march. He was in a different concentration camp, but they reunited and married after the war. And these um, tiny circles of gold are symbolic right. of their, their love that blossomed in this very right. unlikely place. Um, I think it's a very important and potent reminder that we not flatly characterize Jews and others who were incarcerated as victims, but they were still just quite human. Here they are, you know, a young man right. and a young woman who feel a bond and find a way to express it. Um, would like to welcome in particular people who are watching from all over the country and all over the world. Good morning, thank you for joining us from Belvedere, Tennessee, Columbia County, New York, uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Hello to you in Tarrytown, New York, in the state of Wisconsin, uh, from not far away and the beautiful mountains of Cumberland, Maryland. Hello in Sandstone, Minnesota, and internationally, we're glad to have you with us from Kent, England, Boning, Australia, I hope I said it right, Copenhagen, Denmark, Athens, Greece, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and hello to uh, a viewer watching in India. We're so glad to have you with us. And again, please do post your questions for Judy in the comments section. Now, Judy, many of the items in our holdings are, are not three-dimensional objects, um, which we call artifacts. Uh, we also have millions of pieces of paper, um, each with their own story. Please introduce us to um, one extraordinary letter in particular written by a young mother named Vilma Grunwald. What is in this collection and what's its significance? Well, the collection really is centered around one very small letter and it originally had been folded up so that it was just about this big. But yet this letter is unique. It's one of the most heartbreaking and most significant items in our collection. It was a letter that was written an hour before Vilma was killed in Auschwitz. Vilma was married to Kurt, a physician in Czechoslovakia. They had two sons, John and Frank or Misha in Czech. The family was deported first to Theresienstadt and afterwards to Auschwitz. They were together in Auschwitz for about six months before there was a selection and killing action. John had a physical disability and Vilma realized that he would never pass the selection. So she made the ultimate sacrifice of a mother and she decided to accompany her older son so that he wouldn't have to face the horrors alone. Frank, even though he was just a young kid. He was only 12 years old at liberation. He survived. He miraculously survived the alliteration start Auschwitz, also a death march, and the Mauthausen concentration camp. And his father found him after the war, but they never spoke about what happened to Vilma. It was too painful. It was only after Frank became a young adult and after his father passed away that he discovered this letter and real, found out what had happened to his mother. 
And Frank, we are incredibly grateful. He not long ago actually uh, donated the letter to our museum for safekeeping. Um, let's have a look at a video clip of Frank when he came to the museum here in Washington, um, describing this letter, how he came to visit his mother's last words. I came here to see my uh, mother's letter uh, on display. I also brought my son and my grandson. It's really a goodbye letter and it's someone's attitude and behavior and thinking uh, just a couple of hours before they die. I had the idea that instead of being just in my dresser drawer in my house, it needs to be seen. There was very little negative uh, expression in her uh, thinking. She never really considered herself and didn't want us to consider ourselves as victims. She always wanted to keep her chin up high and be very proud about who she was. And she wanted us to be the same way. Judy, could you share with us um, a few lines from the letter, please? So here's a portion. Take care of my golden boy and don't spoil him with too much of your love. My dearest and my only one, don't hold yourself responsible for what happened. It was our destiny. At the fabulous life, we must board the trucks into eternity. Um, yeah, it's hard to, to hear that. I know um, mm -hmm. you're a mother, I'm a mother, to think about what that meant to, for a wife to write that to her husband. Uh, knowing he, she hoped he would go on to live a life she wouldn't see. Um, and for me, the important thing is that the Nazis wanted to destroy physical beings, but they also wanted to destroy, destroy the human soul. And you read that letter and you realize that might have accomplished the first, but they didn't accomplish the second. The soul remained, her love remained, her care for her children remained. And that's really the power of the letter. Judy, we have a very appropriate question from a viewer, although I think you've kind of answered it with your face, um, with your facial expression. Uh, a woman named April is asking, as you are surrounded with these objects, memories that are very important and witnesses of the Holocaust, how do you do your work without becoming emotional? Well, as you can see, I'm very emotional about it. I've um, presented about this pre uh, collection numerous, numerous times, and it always affects me. And I'd say there's something wrong with you if you can read this and not have it affected. The trick is how can you stay emotional? How can you be connected emotionally to it, but at the same time distance yourself just enough in order to pay attention to the details and to try to get the details right. And it's a uh, balancing act. You don't want to be paralyzed with uh, depression, but on the other hand, you want to acknowledge that we're talking about horrific events and you can't just slough it off. Judy, you had mentioned that uh, Frank and his father did not discuss their Holocaust experience um, as they rebuilt their lives together, that it was just simply too painful, too traumatic. How did uh, Frank come to have this letter and how did it come to us eventually? Okay. Well, this is a really interesting story. He found the letter when his father passed away and he was going through the belongings. How it came to us is a different story. And one that I think is interesting for viewers because everyone who's part of the museum community and I'm including people on, who are watching this may be the source of a collection. In this case, I hadn't known Frank from before, but two extraordinary wonderful teachers who are part of our teacher fellowship program heard him speak. And they were so moved by his presentation that they decided they wanted to put together a film. And they had their students make a film. It's called Misha's Fugue. And the students did an extraordinary job. I saw the film and I said, okay, I should retire and just let these high school kids take over. And I'm watching it and Frank is showing the letter. I'm 
And she said, oh my gosh, I've never seen anything like that. So I wrote to the teachers. I said, will Frank be willing to donate it? And sure enough, he agreed and the rest is history. Um, we have a question from a viewer named Christine in the Philippines. She actually sent us this question in advance. Uh, so we had a chance to think about it a little bit. Um, asking, what is the rem most remote place from which some of your materials originate? Well, we really have uh, collections from all over the world. The only continent that's not represented is Antarctica, but we have a lot of material from Asia, including the Philippines, a lot from uh, China, a lot from Latin America, and we even have uh, material from Africa. One of our survivor volunteers by the name of Jill Polly managed to, as a child, she survived the war with her extended family on a farm in Kenya. And this is a tourist brochure uh, from 1939. They knew they could get a visa to Kenya. It's the only place they could get a visa. And so where's Kenya? So they went out and they got a tourist brochure. And this is part of the collection because we're interested not only in the real tragedies, which you saw in Frank's story, but also stories of rescue, because that tells you what was possible if other people had stepped up. And uh, the only way, you know, we have to remember this is decades before the internet was even an idea that they could get information on this place they had perhaps not even heard of before they got a visa to go there was through this tourist brochure with the fantastically ironic caption of the place where life is still worth living. I just, I can't look yeah. at that with a straight face. Um, but I also think that, um, and know deeply that the variety of places of origin of items in our collection speaks to the human experience during the period of the Holocaust. The fact that it was so difficult almost impossible to find places to go to escape Nazi Europe, um, led to Jews scattering all over the world. And the range of materials we have reflects um, those journeys, those um, creative outlets and unexpected experiences. Um, Judy, a viewer named Jeffrey writes in to say, I have a Nazi flag um, from Matthausen signed by some of the liberators of the 21st Infantry um, 11th Armored Division. I'd like to donate it. I think it tells a bit of the story. My dad was one of them. Um, what would you say for, for Jeffrey? I'd ask, first of all, thank you. Thank you for the question. Thanks for reaching out. And would ask if you can email us at curator at ushmm.org and we'll follow up. It's curator, C-U-R-A-T-O-R -R, at ushmm.org. And we appreciate everyone who uh, contacts us. And we will post that email address also in the comment section. So if you didn't get to write it down quickly, um, we would be very glad to hear from you, Jeffrey, and anyone else. Um, Judy, we've talked um, so far about how the collection holds evidence of crimes, um, of escape, but it also documents active rescue, life-saving actions. Uh, tell us, please, about a man named Ben Sion Kalb and the collection that his family gave to the museum. Ben Sion Kalb was a Polish Jew who early on escaped from Poland into Slovakia. That first sounds a little strange because Slovakia was a Nazi ally. It was a fascist country and was actually the first country to deport its Jews to Auschwitz. But these deportations stopped and it became a relative safe haven with the emphasis on relative. It was still under a Nazi satellite, but it was much safer than Poland. He gets to Slovakia and connects with the Jewish underground there, the Jewish resistance group called the Working Group. And for about two years, he works trying to figure out how can he bring his fiance across the border as well. And he eventually finds a way and he smuggles her across the mountains into Slovakia. That could have been the end of the story, except he said, wait a second, if there's a way to get my fiance over the mountains into Slovakia, there's a way to get other Jews over as well. And over the course of about nine months, he was able to help bring about a thousand Jews across to Slovakia and then of most of them made their way to Hungary from there. And we're talking, you said, 
how many people? Um, we don't have an exact number, but we think it's approximately a thousand people that were saved. Uh, many of these survived the war and have given testimonies. Um, we've contacted lots of them. One of the uh, extraordinary parts of this collection is it includes lists of names and people often say, well, prove it. How do you know? But here we have names, lists, not only names, but dates of birth, because which is helpful since often people have the same name, uh, where they were from. And so we've been able to work tracking down people. This is an incredible photograph that you see. Here's Ben Sion Kalb again with two little boys. Those are not his own children. These are the Weinberg boys who were among the first to be brought across in his rescue effort. This photograph was taken during the war right after they came. And there's also a document that says about how these poor orphans arrived without family, without clothing, without shoes. And here they are, made it to Slovakia. They then went on to Hungary and eventually got to Palestine. Now Israel, where they're both living today. It's incredible. incredible. And again, a seemingly unexceptional photograph. You might assume it's a father with his two cute little fluffy kids. Yeah. But in fact, it tells a story of um, immense loss and tragedy and immense, immense um, heroism and luck as well, all contained in this um, photo that if you don't know the backstory, you might just flip, flip by it. Um, Judy, please tell us, though, about another survivor from Kalb's network with whom you had a chance encounter. Okay, so I spent a lot of time going through the lists of names and deliberately looking for people. But then, as you say, you can also have a chance encounter. I was so taken with this collection that I would talk about it a lot. And I presented about the collection at a senior living facility. There was one woman in the audience who became very, very emotional. She raised her hand afterwards and asked the first question. She said, I feel as if you were telling my story. I was only a preschooler when the war ended. I know I was born in Poland. I know I was liberated in Hungary, but I have no memory of how I got from point A to point B. We met up and I brought the list of names with her. Well, her name wasn't on the list. However, her older cousin who crossed with her her name was on the list. And so for the first time in her life, she had tangible proof of how she had survived the Holocaust and how her entire family had managed to flee from Poland to safety in Hungary. And one of the best days I've ever had at the museum in 25 years was witnessing a reunion with her, Barbara Firestone, with the son of Ben Sion, Mark Kolb. And, and they have some footage yeah. here, uh, the uh, exhibit that they saw is the letters on uh, display. And here she's in our conservation lab. And for the first time, she sees the original document that's the proof of how she survived. Miriam Galtzer is her older cousin. It's so beautiful and moving. And again, it's just a simple typewritten piece of paper, but it answers questions. It fills in the blanks. She is able to thank the son of the man who organized this underground railroad that gave her a life and a family, a multi-generational family. Um, it, it's truly extraordinary. Um, Judy, we have a bunch of questions coming in for you. It's okay. great. Um, uh, a man named Grant asks, what proportion of your collections are digitized and available to researchers and the public? Okay, so I'll talk about availability first. Um, if you go to collections at ushmm.org, you'll find a large portion of the collection there. And that is especially important now under COVID because people can't come into the museum, but we have as much out as possible. That said, there's a huge backlog because we've been collecting from around 1989 and digitization is fairly new technology. 
And it's more than just pressing a green button before everything's digitized. We wanna make sure that the scans match the catalog records. So there's a backlog, uh, takes a while for things to come up um, on, but we continue to digitize as much as possible when once we're back in the building. But uh, even with the backlog, you'll find a huge amount of material, uh, collections at USHMM, and um, I think you'll likely find what you're looking for. And when you say huge, there are tens and tens and tens of thousands of items that you can examine. Right, um, including oral histories and actually uh, footage, uh, moving images, film and video. Right. So there's a variety. Including home movies, you know, the kind right. of thing. So I think that the digitization and the accessibility is significant because it's not only about something you can see from afar, but I don't have the equipment to watch a 1930s yeah. home movie in my house and also objects that could not be handled um, in person, uh, but by having them digitized, you can have access. And that actually leads to another question that's come in on Facebook, Judy, asking about what is the most fragile artifact in our collection? So I always am reluctant to say this is the most because you know, you can come up with something else, but I can say one of the most is some paper flowers. These paper flowers were given to another liberator by the name of Francis Fife, um, also a subcamp of Dachau. And he kept them, he became mayor of a uh, city in uh, Virginia. He kept them on his desk and nobody knew what they were. And finally, after some time, his wife said, what are these old, flowers, why are you keeping them? And he told the story. If you look at it very carefully, you can see they're made out of Nazi forms and Nazi documents. And when the Americans came through, one prisoner was so overwhelmed with gratitude. He said, I have to give something as a gift to show my appreciation. And he made these flowers. Unfortunately, they're, as we say, very fragile. You can see some pieces are already flaking off. So we can't put it on display, which is why it's so important that people can view them and learn about it through the web. And in fact, our, um, our colleagues who took these photographs um, told us when we were preparing for this program that when they were staging the photos and, and filming and photographing them, um, they were asked to, to not talk, to try not to breathe or cough or sneeze near them, um, lest they just shatter in front of them. Mm -hmm. um, this is also a chance really to, to mention and give incredible gratitude and respect to our expert conservators on staff. Uh, we have people who know the ins and outs of exactly how to stabilize, <clears throat> excuse me, paper. Um, someone who specializes just in textiles, in cloth. Um, how to keep that careful balance between preserving an object in the state in which we found it so that it doesn't look perfect, it doesn't look cleaned up, it shows its, its battle scars. Um, and, and that kind of thing. Um, but at the same time, we'll continue um, to be safe and uh, preserved uh, for the long run. And one of the things we say is when the eyewitness generation all passes, it's these artifacts that are the living eyewitnesses. And that's why it's so, so crucial that they be preserved for as long as uh, humanly possible. Agree. Judy, we have just a few minutes left. Um, I do want to thank a couple of our partner organizations for tuning in. I'm really glad to have you with us today from both the Georgia Commission on the Holocaust and from my home state, uh, the Illinois Holocaust Museum. Uh, good morning to all of you. Um, Judy, could you tell us about some of the other challenges we face, not only in conservation, but in, in learning from items in our collection, in understanding them? So probably the most difficult challenge is learning the backstory. As you pointed out with the photo of Benzion Kalb and the two orphans, it's a seemingly benign photo, but it's the backstory that's so important. When we were primarily collecting from survivors, we spent hours and hours interviewing them about everything. Now we're collecting from descendants of survivors. In this particular case, the son, Mark, really knew this uh, collection back and forth. But often we'll get children, grandchildren, who know there's a Holocaust connection but don't have the details. And so we spend a lot of time going through other databases, 
different archival collections, making connections to try to really verify every point of the collection to establish the historic significance. And it's painstaking work, but we feel it's crucial. It's also um, not only to understand it, but to authenticate, because once we have something in our holdings, we need to be able to document and state with confidence that the story is true. And I don't mean that someone is making things up, but we all know the way that family history can get garbled, or we think it's from one place or another, or you find something and you're not sure how old it is. So we have to find sources that um, corroborate also, that, that reinforce um, the, the fact that, you know, this person was in this place at that time, and therefore the object plausibly also was there. Um, Judy, we have someone writing to us on Twitter um, named Jennifer asking, and this may be too hard for you, what object resonates with Judy the most that she has worked with through the years? It's like picking your favorite child, right? Yeah, no, I can't do that. Um, you did see some of my favorites today. Um, personally, I'm interested in stories that show how life continued despite the horrors. You don't want to minimize the horrors because that's the reality. Uh, well, questions that uh, speak to me as an individual are collections that we saw today that show how human beings coped and preserved humanity despite these impossible, impossible, horrific, murderous times that they were inside, facing. Yeah, and I would have to agree, Judy. I mean, I think some of the objects that have um, stayed with me the most that are imprinted on my brain after more than 20 years working here are the ones that that look familiar you know mm -hmm. the, the the toothbrush the children's drawing the kind of thing where you know you have objects like that lying around your house and yet you know if these silent witnesses could speak to you the story they would tell is one that is profoundly profoundly different um, one other um, challenge that we face and hurdle that we face um, in understanding and um, kind of um, doing a, a full dissection, if you will, of our material is that we have objects and documents that require so many different language skills. We need translators in many, many languages. Even deciphering old fashioned handwriting is not easy. So when we get an object, it's really just the beginning of our relationship with it and also of understanding how it relates to other materials that we hold. Um, Judy, I'd like to ask you a kind of bigger picture pullback question um, in closing. In all of your work here, how do you feel, how do you think that our collections help us to better understand the, the human dimension of the Holocaust you've made reference to so many times today? Well, there are phenomenal history books on the Holocaust and war being written every day. But these tend to tell a more global uh, picture. Not always are micro histories, but as a result, we have a very clear understanding of the who, what, where, when. But what's missing often are individual stories, and that's what the collection can provide. Um, I think I mentioned before we talk about virtual tombstones, preserving people's memory. Um, there are sort of small parts of the history that are left out of the larger narratives, not because the historians aren't doing their job because they're amazing historians, but because these bits of history were kept inside a family and never exposed to the greater public. And it's these bits that tell you about individual people, what they did, how they coped, how they reacted, uh, that really do show as you uh, just asked me, the human dimension. And it's such a critical part because the Holocaust isn't just the Holocaust as a single entity. It's the story of millions and millions of people. Well, Judy, I always learn a great deal. I'm always very moved in hearing about your work. And I want to thank you for everything that you do, um, you not only with me. your head, but your heart. Thank you for being with us. Um, one of our colleagues, um, one of your co-workers on your team, another collections curator, uh, talks about our holdings as a jigsaw puzzle with no borders, that every time we acquire something new, it just adds to the story, um, expands our understanding, and we see it in relation to everything else. Uh, speaking personally, I come from a survivor family myself, 
And I'm proud to say that we have donated our family photographs, our precious family letters and papers uh, to the museum, not just because I work here, um, but because I knew that they would be in safekeeping in perpetuity, that I wouldn't have to worry about them getting torn up or burning up in a fire. But the most important thing about that actually is that uh, I have gained and my family members have gained a much deeper understanding of our own experience. There were things we thought had only happened to us. And in fact, all of the items in our collection are in constant dialogue with each other. When we look at them across this landscape of um, similar and diverse items, we understand how things came to happen and why in a different way. Um, so it's, it's been a very powerful experience and one I'm, I'm grateful for. Uh, I want to thank you, our viewers, for joining us today to explore just, to, you know, in the most surface way, we could really go on for hours about the way that these seemingly ordinary objects, many once belonging to victims and survivors, reveal powerful, powerful stories of tragedy, survival, and hope. And as Judy said, these silent witnesses are even more critical as the number of living human eyewitnesses diminishes daily. We're glad you are with us today. Uh, we want to note in closing that yesterday marked the start here in the United States of Hispanic Heritage Month. And in tribute, um, by popular demand, I do want to note that we have added Spanish language captions to many of the programs in the museum's Stay Connected Facebook Live series, which you can view on demand. We are glad to make them accessible. We also hope that you will join us for our next program, which will be held on October 7th at 9.30 a.m. This program will actually uh, be broadcast in Spanish and later captioned in English. The subject is Bold Actions That Led to Refuge in Latin America or Acciones Osadas Que Condujeron al Refugio in America Latina. Again, it will be in Spanish, captioned in English, and we will be highlighting stories of individuals who found safety and settled in the region during and after the Holocaust. Hope to see you on the 7th and October of October. Until then, happy new year to all who celebrate and be healthy and well. Bye-bye.